All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to be here with you all. My name is Ben Sangroth, and I am here to talk some artificial intelligence in the classroom uh, for you. So uh, this session, we are going to focus on AI and its classroom applications in school uses. So how can we look at artificial intelligence and the concept of AI uh, in our classrooms and how it can help both us as teachers and educators and also our students that need some extra supports that, that AI is going to be able to uh, really help them succeed uh, as they you know journey through their educational career. So uh, so I'm really excited about this topic. I am 100% uh, in on, on AI, even though it is quite a undertaking to kind of get your brain wrapped around about what it does and, and all that good stuff. So hopefully we'll unpack a lot of that here in our hour together uh, and answer hopefully some of the questions that you have about artificial intelligence and its place in education. So um, okay, so without further ado, my name is Ben Sangroth. I am the lead regional ed tech coordinator for the Learning Technology Center of Illinois. Uh, so I'm located in Dixon, Illinois. Uh, and what I do is I support uh, teachers and uh, school districts uh, throughout the state of Illinois, but more important, more focused on uh, the northwest uh, kind of corner of the state of Illinois. Uh, I live in Dixon. Uh, which is about 120 miles west of Chicago, so a uh, handful hours uh, south of uh, of you guys in Minnesota there. So um, my contact information is on the slide here. Feel free to reach out with any uh, questions that you have. I know Kelsey will send out that information as well if you need anything or she can follow up with me. Uh, you can follow me on my socials as well. Happy to, happy to do that. So um, I am a former history teacher. Uh, turned ed tech nerd. And so this topic of bringing AI into the classroom is really fascinating to me because I found a lot of really cool uses uh, that that I think are just really neat for all levels. So it doesn't matter, I think, if you're a kindergarten teacher or a pre-K teacher, um, all the way up to high school and higher ed, uh, you know, it, it has a place. And I think you need to be aware. I think it's really important for teachers to be aware of what it is and, and understand what this thing is that everybody's talking about. So here's our agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to do a little bit of a background on what is artificial intelligence. I think it's, uh, as I said, I think it's important for educators to really, truly understand where AI came from, what it is, what it's doing, how long has it been here, uh, and and where it might go from here. So we're going to do a little bit of a history lesson uh, on AI. Uh, then we're going to get into really the meat of this, and that is um AI uses in education. Okay. So we're going to really dive into what AI can do to help you. I've got lots of examples that I want to be able to show uh, and showcase. I want to be able to let you guys know what are some of those things that you can help uh, use AI for uh, in the classroom. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, here at the end to go over some limitations and challenges as well. Although in uh, talking uh, to Kelsey earlier today, I think we might have to do another full hour on that because the earlier session, we didn't quite get to any of those. So it's ambitious to put those on, on the list. So, um, all right, great. And it looks like we have a participant joining us too. So welcome. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with uh, this question of what is AI? Okay. Um, and so, you know, I've got my little friend here that uh, I actually AI generated, um, you know, on here. And I'm going to pose this question for you guys to think about. Oh, good. Cut two. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Uh, so I will pose this question. Kelsey, you already know the answer because you saw it this morning. So uh, Michael, I'll put this in there. You can drop it in the chat uh, if you want. Um, how long do you think AI has been around for? I'm gonna I think you. it's been around since the 50s. Like 1955. All right. <laughs> I know what happened there. I see in the background now. <laughs> 1950s. Man, you nailed it. I knew the head shake, though, from before that. So um, so 1950s. So this is our timeline that we're going to go on. Um, kind of going through the very brief history here. I'm going to try and make it even a little bit more brief than this morning so we can get to some more ex examples. But um, we have this very brief history of, of AI here. And one of the things that we want to make sure everybody's aware of when you hear about this thing, chat GPT, what is it? Where did this AI tool come from? Is that it's been around for a long time. And so we have the first example of, uh, you know, machine and computing intelligence being brought forth in a paper called uh, by Alan Turing, who publishes an article suggesting that machines can think for themselves. Uh, and he calls this the Turing test. 
And so we look back 80 plus years ago and we think, oh my gosh, people were already forward thinking enough to think that these new machines can start to think for themselves. Um, and then in 55, we get our first real program that is invented called the logic theorist. And what this was doing was using logic based learning to then predict what the input a user wanted out of it. So it was using logic theory. I remember taking philosophy and having to go through logic uh, and doing arguments and things like that because of this equals this equals that. And this program was able to do that, which is pretty cool in 1955 that somebody could input that and have it spit it back out. But then the big ones come forward and Eliza comes out in 1964. So this is actually our first chat bot. And so when we think about the news cycle today, and we think about chat GPT, we think about Google's Bard, we think about Microsoft's uh, Bing and Sydney is what that one's called. Those tools all are called chatbots. And they're all, we're going to talk about them later. They're native language uh, processing processors. And that first came out with Eliza in 1964. And so when the news cycle picks up and we get to why it's all going crazy right now in 2023, it's really starting back in the 60s and in 64 with the first chatbot being Eliza. The next two are really going on that machine learning component here. And that's when we get into our nav lab and our first autonomous automobile. So really the precursor to all our Teslas and our, two, our uh, Waymo taxis and those things that come out now that are autonomously uh, able to drive themselves. Uh, that was actually, that came out in 1986. And then we have the computer beating uh, the grandmaster Gary Kasparov at chess in 1997, a huge milestone in that the fact that computers are in fact smarter than humans and what would be considered like our most intelligent game. And they're able to beat us at it. Uh, and then Dragon Systems comes out with the first speech recognition software at that same time. And so in the 90s, we're starting to see this development of machine learning and machines being able to think, process information and produce content because the computer is growing, you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more PCs, you know, just the world of computer science is growing at this time, too. But it's really when we turn into the 2000s that we start to see the big boom in machine learning and AI. Um, and so when we talk about this, we think about I've mentioned machine learning multiple times. And artificial intelligence is a function of machine learning. And so machine learning is kind of the overarching like umbrella. And then there's lots of little stems that fall off of it. And AI is one of those things because what artificial intelligence is, is it is learning. It's a machine that is learning from its past experience that it's been programmed with. And so it's able to produce content based off of the items that it's been programmed with. So that's when we get into something like the Roomba that comes out in 2002. And the Roomba comes out in 2002, machine learning, can learn your home, goes on its own. You don't have to program it. You just set it down. It learns. It does it. Siri comes out in 08 uh, and then gets better and better and better. And then Watson comes out. Uh, IBM's Watson is the first supercomputer that actually does do a lot of machine learning. Uh, it is artificial intelligence in 2011. It's just not commercially available for normal people. That is something that sticks in with the corporations, healthcare industries, finance departments, big companies, they're purchasing Watson to essentially be today's AI, but for their specialty. So that data is uploaded for them, and then they're able to uh, use it in their discipline. Alexa comes out in 14. That's the one that we're all very familiar with. You have Google Home comes out in 2016. Same thing. Uh, we're able to use those tools every day. My son is able to go up, ask the Google certain questions. It responds. It finds the information and answers how you want it to answer it. Uh, and it goes from there. But then this is the kicker. So 2020 or so 2022, this is when everything goes nuts. So if you're like, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I know, why come I didn't hear about this, you know, until this year? It's because it wasn't around really. Like all this stuff existed, but yet it didn't exist in a way that we were using it in a more powerful manner. Like the stuff that is super intelligent, super powerful was kept from the commoner um, behind like IBM's big paywalls, you know, millions of dollars to get Watson. Sam Altman comes out and decides that he wants to build a AI tool that is open to the public. He forms OpenAI. He builds this product. He then releases ChatGPT, uh, Dali, Crayon, which is another uh, uh, AI tool, and they're released to the public in 2022. And so, Kelsey, I didn't tell you this this morning, so I'll drop another fun fact on you. Uh, the reason that these are now open or are available to everybody is because they make them open source. And so what they've done is they've created these APIs. So you have this API access point right here. What this means 
is that OpenAI and Chat and for ChatGPT says, you know what? We want this available to the masses. So if you insert company want to use our tool, you can have what is called API access to it and embed it into your system, which will then allow your users to essentially use chat GPT, but through your own interface. And so for example, an AI, an API would be uh, one of these extensions, I guess uh, here, Pear Deck. So for an educator, we've got Pear Deck here. I can open up the Pear Deck add-on. Um, I actually don't have it on this particular profile. I've got it on my school one, but Pear Deck is a great tool. It works through the back door of Google Slides and then opens up in Google Slides. I could go to Pear Deck's website and use it, but I also use, they have, Google has granted them an API that has allowed them to essentially backdoor into Google and integrate Pear Deck in with Google Slides. That's what OpenAI did. OpenAI said, cool companies, you want to use this in your system? You can pay us. You can have access. It can be embedded in you. That's where we get uh, uh, Microsoft investing something like $20 billion dollars in chat GPT to integrate it into their soft, into their Bing search engine uh, because OpenAI has allowed them access to it and has also allowed us all as commoners to use it on the front end. So we have access to this product and this tool. So that's why it's like gone crazy over the last couple of years because we finally got uh, the ability to do it. So what is AI? Okay, so what is this artificial intelligence machine learning component, okay? Well, there are four kind of categories that we break this down into. Um, and the biggest one is the global kind of overarching one that a lot of this AI stuff that we're talking about today and in you know education in particular is generative AI. Okay, so generative AI, what that is in simple terms is it generates new content. So when I pose a question to the, the machine, the, to the platform, it takes and relies on its information that it has been programmed with and then gives me an answer that it predicts that I want it to do, okay? So how AI works as a whole is it is preloaded with information from programmers, from whatever company has created it. So OpenAI is the creator of ChatGPT. They have, op they have loaded up ChatGPT with thousands and millions and actually trillions of data sets worth of information. Something along the lines of like, I think it was 370 gig on ChatGPT3 worth of data, which is a tremendous number. And then what it does is it digests that. And then when I ask it a question, it will then be able to answer based off of that data. Ah, good question. How does Microsoft earn back its $20 billion investment? That's a really good question. Um, they want to get the market share of search back from Google. And so like, uh, here would be a good example of that. If I do a Bing search and I use Bing instead of Google, they're able to harvest my data and my information and then sell it to marketers because they know I searched for new golf shoes. And so then that goes into their coffers and their marketers that they sell it to. If I search for that in Google, Microsoft gets none of that, even if I search from it from a PC. And so by adding ChatGPT to their search, they're hoping to draw more users in to then harvest more data to then make more money from advertisers, essentially. So it's a big risk um, for sure for them to do it. But, uh, and then especially because Google then released Bard like shortly thereafter and then integrated Bard into search already too. So um, Google users are pretty much gonna stick with Google probably now, but anyways, yeah, good question. Okay. So we got the generative AI. It's generating new content when I ask it posed a question. The biggest thing here, <clears throat> especially when we talk about it for education, is this next data point here with natural language processing. So what this is, or these are AI tools that have a way that they are trained to communicate with individuals. They're trained to communicate with humans in particular. And so they are conversational. They're the chatbots. So when I talk to one or I ask one a question, it responds back to me in a way that seems like a human is on the other side. Okay. So this is where I'll go in. And I used Bard this morning a bunch. I'm going to go in and actually bring chat GPT over and, and do it here. So this is chat GPT. This is what it looks like. There's two different versions that are currently out. You have chat G, you have GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. If you want to pay $20 a month, you can get GPT 4. It has uh, more stuff. It has more data sets. It has a, uh, better platform. It's fast. It's actually not faster, but it has more data to go through. 
but it's also you're guaranteed to get in every day. And this is something for educators that's important. Uh, GP, chat, GP, chat GPT right now, three and a half. I struggled like this morning. I tried to get in at like 830. I couldn't get in. It was overflow. It was too filled. Too many people were in it. I didn't have access to it. Uh, I waited until like 930. I was able to get in. Uh, and if I bought GPT-4, they're guaranteeing me my lane in every single time and I get more stuff. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, the other problem is BARD, not currently available for Google for Education accounts. So if I wanted to open BARD up on my Google for Education, it's going to be, like I'll say, try BARD. And it's going to block me here in just a second. Oh, I've, I've got access. Okay. Well, I've got access to Bard now. That's new. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just see Bard was just updated. Now I've got access to Bard on my work computer or my work account. This is going to open up a can of worms with educators. So, <laughs> all right, now I got something to think about at work tomorrow. All right, back to chat GPT. Um, so here's what this natural language processor is. I ask it a question. I'll ask it a question. I will say, uh, give me, so I'm, I'm a teaching history. That's my background. I have to teach uh, tomorrow uh, about, or maybe it's geography. I've been kind of obsessed with Mount Everest of late. I don't know why I keep getting all these Mount Everest videos on like my Facebook and Instagram. I've watched a couple of YouTube videos on it. It fascinates me. So I can ask this. I can say, you know what? I heard this name, Sir Edmund Hillary. I have no idea what he did. So I can say, give me a brief history on Sir Edmund Hillary. And so within seconds, I get my entire history, brief history on Sir Edmund Hillary here. And what this is, is you can see the chatbot part of this. It comes in and it's very informal, like certainly. And then it goes into it like it's conversational. And that's when we're talking about generative AI and AI having this natural language processing where it sounds like there's a human providing the information to me from this. But in reality, there's nobody over there. It's not a sentient being. And that's the biggest thing that people get confused about is that they start chatting with this. Like I can say something like, I can go back to chat GPT and I can create a new chat, say, I'm having a bad day. It apologizes right off the bat. I'm sorry to hear that you're having a bad day. Like, you know, so like it is that back and forth of like, I'm talking to somebody and it's able to give me that conversational tone back and forth. Like there's another human on the other side, but nobody's there. It's just the machine predicting what I want it to say back. So this is the big thing with this natural language processing. It's a lot like arguing with a junior high kid. Um, or a elementary school kid, like my six-year-old, where if they're trying to get something from you, they're going to say whatever they can say to be correct um, or to get you to like them, right? But they're also going to debate you and try to be correct, even though they know they're not correct. And so they're going to be very confident in a not so cute manner, I guess. One of the things that really this reminds me of, uh, and this goes into the refinable part of this. Wait, I I'm sorry to interrupt you. What do you mean when you say, even though they know they are not correct? Oh, like my six-year-old who claims that uh, a the world's most dangerous spider is in Africa. And I'm like, that's not true. Like, I don't, where did you learn that at? And he's like, I just know. And I'm like, well, you just know, you don't know. And you. chat GPT can do the same thing. Like, it'll sound very, very correct. But, but isn't not. it trying to give you the right answer? Why would it give you a false answer? Ah, good question. Because it wants to be right. And so it'll just make something up, which is the scary part about. And that's, uh, isn't that because it like is scanning through all this data and it just doesn't know that they come from Australia or. Yes. So in part, yes. In part, they don't know why. So 
you can actually even uh you can you can watch i've watched there's a 60 minutes article on or a 60 minutes video um and actually uh kelsey i mentioned it this morning i'll try to find that and drop that in um where they are interviewing uh sundar uh i can't think of his last name but he's the ceo of google about this and they ask him they're like what is what a, what about these they call them hallucinations and they say so well, how do they happen and he says we don't know they don't know which is kind of very scary like they don't know why it just makes stuff up it almost like it wants to fill the void like i don't know why my 6 year old makes stuff up but he does and it's the same thing with chat gpt um i'll give you a i'll show you an example here um uh, i have two windows open so let me see if i can find the one of it being wrong there we go are we 47 school districts so if i asked it i said what are the school districts at the regional office of education number 47 in sterling illinois serves it gave me a list first one number one is not in roe 47 it's in roe 8 it's not even in the same one of the counties that roe 47 serves they also left off uh all of the lee and ogle county school districts that this roe serves they didn't put those in now when you ask like even sam altman from open ai like they've asked why does this happen they don't know um and so the only thing they know is that it's trying to process and predict and get a right answer for you and so this is where it's a little bit interesting or very interesting the excuse that actually the Google CEO gave was that, uh, or no, it was one of the uh, VPs. It was like one of the guys underneath of him. He says, well, to be fair, humans do this too. He said, humans hallucinate and humans make things up to sound right. And we don't know why humans do it. And then I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? He's right. Like not in the fact that like people are like, you know, some people are like compulsory liars more so that like, I tell a story based on my recollection of something that happened in college. And I tell that story for 15 years after I graduated. And then I get back together with my friends and I tell the story and one will be like from baseball. I played college baseball and they'll be like, no, dude, you didn't hit him in. You hit him in. Like he was on second base, not the other guy. I'd be like, no, it was Russell. And they're like, no, it was Aiken. I'd be like, but I, but I have been telling the story that it was Russell for 15 years in my brain. That's what happened. I have essentially hallucinated in, you know, just like AI is doing and telling like stories and stuff back. It's pretty terrifying. Um, and I don't believe that saying that a machine is like a human is a great answer, unless maybe we are all just like living in simulation and this we're all machines anyways. I don't know. Like that could be it too. Um, and is there any possibility that some of it also is connected to uh, what the sources are? So an example is like, if you're saying that chat GBT, that their source is, uh, you know, is up to 2021, mm -hmm. uh, that that data may have changed, not maybe in this example, but like in some examples that it's just out of date. Oh, that's absolutely could happen. Yeah. Like it's, it'll say, you know, it'll reference something that's out of date. Yep. That 100% could, could definitely be a case. Um, I think it's the fact that the two things they don't know when it comes to the natural language processing are the hallucination parts, the inaccuracy of the data sets that have been uploaded into it, that it draws upon. Uh, and then the last one that's a little terrifying and I, a bit off of uh, the track here with this, but I think it goes into the refinability part of this and actually it goes into the generative part of this. Um, Google's Bard was not programmed in Bangladesh and they prompted it with one sentence of the Bangladesh national anthem in Bangladesh. And it immediately was able to, uh, one sentence, and was immediately able to translate everything into Bangladesh. And they don't know how it did that. They don't know how it learned it. Because they only put one sentence in. They didn't say learn this language. They just typed it in in Bangladesh. And then it was fully fluent in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh. And they asked it, they asked like on the video, they're like, do you know why? And they're like, no, we don't know why. So, so like they're, the machines are like, they're learning too, which is not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to just take the information that we give them and process it and spit it back out, not learn. 
like machine learning happens, but like, not like that. Like they shouldn't be able to learn a new language, <laughs> you know, which is it's wild. Um, it is yeah. wild, but I, I thought, of, I thought the whole point though of it was, that was the whole point was like for it to learn. So it's not supposed, it's, it's supposed to like, it's in a, in a, in a way, but not in this, not in the AI sense of um, like adapting. It's only supposed to draw on the information that it's doing. So when it appears to be learning or appears to be giving you new ideas, it's just being really good at predicting what you want out of that. So like my best uh, example of that is that uh, and it came from a, a YouTube video where it's really good at analyzing data and then spitting out what should happen, right? So it appears to be learning. Like it appears that it's like, oh, it's really smart, it's learned. So uh, the use of this case would be like, uh, you can put in all of these symptoms for a really complex disease. And it'll say, I believe that you are suffering from this type of cancer. And that type of cancer usually exists on a six month window of, you know, you have a life expectancy of six months. And then you type in some more information and it spits out, oh, okay, now you have eight months. It looks like, oh, it's learned more because I've given it more information. It hasn't actually learned anything. It's just got more information to dot, kind of use its database and then spit out an information piece to you. What it doesn't do is it doesn't use the judgment component of a human brain to create new things, right? So like the example in the YouTube video that uh, Kelsey found from 60 Minutes is that it says like it can create a million different short stories in the time it took Hemingway to write one. But would any of those 1 million be as good as one Hemingway short story? And the answer is maybe, but it doesn't rely, like the machine doesn't have the ability to put in feeling and thought and experience and emotion into things because it doesn't have any of that. It's like data from Star Trek. So when data is in Star Trek, he has no emotion. He can't, he doesn't feel attached to, to anything and he's never worried about anything. He's stone cold the entire time. Right. And it's frustrating to his human counterparts because they're like, they're panicking. He's just data, right? Because data is AI. He's just machine. He's just taking in whatever's pre-programmed and going with it. Um, and so, yeah, the machine learning component, I can see how that could be a little bit like kind of confusing and that's supposed to learn but it's not, they're not, these chatbots, these natural language processors aren't supposed to learn, except they are. So, and they don't have an, at least they're not telling us the reason why they're doing it. <laughs> well, I know that we could get on this one for a long time. So maybe we could go on to the next piece. You're right. You're right. All right. So I'm loving this. This is great. <laughs> I appreciate everything. I thank you. It's good stuff. Um, so here's the thing we've got, when we get into this, we also want to learn how we can refine it. And this is where it's really important, like education too, okay, is understanding how we can refine these things, how we can make it better. Because prompts and the AI and the chat GPT and BARD are only as good as the prompts that we give them, okay? And that's where the refinability part comes into this, where if I ask a vague question, I'm going to get a vague answer. If I ask a specific question, I'm going to get a much more detailed, specific answer. And that's the cool part about AI is that you can keep refining it. And so I'm going to quickly go through this uh, as, as our uh, example here is building from Legos. Okay. So when I build from Legos or my son builds from Legos, we get all the Lego bricks in front of us. We have to pick and choose which bricks make the right thing that we're trying to build. AI has all of the Lego bricks. They're all uploaded into its system. And then I tell it, build me a car. And then it's going to find all of those little individual bricks to build me a car. And it might build me a car, but it might build me the wrong model of car. It might build a blue car and I wanted a red car. So then I have to tell it, I want a red car. So it's going to tear all those bricks apart. It's going to regenerate. And it's going to find all the red bricks that build a red car. And it's going to do that. And I say, nope, I don't want to, I want a red Lamborghini. Tear it all down, build it all back. Now I've made it more specific, but it needs to find those bricks inside of all the information that has been pre-programmed into it in order to do it. And if nobody's pre-programmed it with what a red Lamborghini looks like, it's never going to be able to generate a red Lamborghini. It's going to re maybe I say a red sports car and it'll give me something that maybe looks like a Lamborghini, but it's never actually going to give me a Lamborghini because it doesn't know what a Lamborghini is. 
Now, here's where it does learn. To your point, if it does create something that looks good, I can tell it, hey, that looks like a Lamborghini and thumbs up it in the chat or in whatever it did. And then it's going to learn it because it's now gotten smarter because I've told it, I've up, I've essentially now uploaded something into its system by saying, nice job. You did that correctly. Now you've learned. So that's where the appearance of learning takes place because we're saying like, just like we learn anything, you're like, oh yeah, that's correct. Good job. You're like, sweet. I'm going to now regurgitate that fact because I know it's correct. Uh, and that's essentially what AI is doing. So the Lego example is a good one, I think. Okay. Um, here's just some of those, uh, some data sets. We've already kind of talked about this slide, but this is the one, this is GPT-3. Uh, 3.5 is out, so it's got more and four has more, but this is it. 1.76 or 176 billion parameters and 570 gigabits of data from books, websites, articles, and more. I can't even begin to like, even put that into like what that means because I don't comprehend numbers that are that big, um, but it's a lot. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, I think it's important when we talk about ChatGPT, is that ChatGPT is not actively searching the internet. It's not looking for new information because it's not hooked up to the internet, technically. Uh, it uses the internet, it scanned the internet previously, and then uploaded all that into its database. Uh, in part, which is now in that limitations and challenges section of today, copyright issues are a big deal now because people are saying that their work has been essentially, they believe, stolen by ChatGPT and uploaded without their consent. Uh, because there's a, some sort of big online, like it's not dark web, but it's like this black library. And it's where like all these books and works are kind of quasi stolen and put into. And you can have access to it somehow. I don't know where it exists on the internet, but it's there. And ChatGPT used that to train itself. So I can ask it to do something uh, on a book that is uh, copyrighted. So let's see, I'll do one. Uh, give me a brief synopsis on Angels and Demons by Dan Brown. I spelled synopsis incorrectly, but hopefully it's smart enough to understand that. The odds are Dan Brown did not give ChatGPT and OpenAI permission to learn its book. But I've read that book and Robert Langdon is the one and it is goes into the Vatican and he does all of that and it gives me that. And I, you know, it gives me the entire breakdown of the book. I can say, give me a chat. I wonder if it'll do this. I don't know. I haven't tried this one before. Look at this. So this is where we get into some copyright issues because now did Dan Brown, does Dan Brown want somebody to just go in and get a chapter by chapter summary of his book? Well, can you say, say, give me the whole book? It won't do that. I have asked it to give me that before, um, but I can try. Let's see. Can you, I think it'll say it won't be able to uh, give me chapter one of the book. Yeah. Verbatim excerpts from copyrighted texts. So it's like kind of trying to like get around it, right? It's like, no, I'm just trying to, you know, give you a little verbatim of it. It's like, I'm not giving you the whole book, but yet it gave me a pretty good breakdown of it. When we think about this in education, though, this could be super helpful because if I'm teaching angels and demons, I don't know why I would, but like if I'm teaching that and I need like to catch a kid up or I need to develop a study guide. I could say something like, um, well, let me look for a book back here that I would teach. I don't have any. Um, I don't have any that I would teach it. But I could ask it to do that and then it would help me. It could maybe give me a study guide for it. So I could say something like, give me a study guide for a 11th grade literature student who is reading this book or class. That saves me a whole lot of time as a teacher. And I think one of the things that I'm finding interesting at least is that you can put in modifiers too. Like 
mm -hmm. uh, fascinating details, or you can add, put add words in that um, can change the tone or what how it's being written. Absolutely. So like, and the big thing like here for like an education too, like I put in 11th grade, maybe I've got a kid. And uh, so we're going to change this. We're going to do, uh, we're going to do Tom Sawyer. I need a study guide for chapter one through five of Tom Sawyer Finn for a 10th grade student. Okay, so this is good. So we're gonna get to your qualifier part here, Kelsey, because now I've got this for a 10th grader, but I have a student in my class who reads at a seventh grade reading level. And so I need to make that accommodation for this student. So I have my 10th grade one that is still going, you know, and giving me all this. And I say, okay, this is good for my 10th grader. That's great. We're going to stop generating. Now I say, can you rewrite that at uh, for a student that reads at a seventh grade level? So we'll just compare here with meet Tom Sawyer, a playful and mischievous boy who lives with his Aunt Polly in a town called St. Petersburg. In this chapter, we're introduced to uh, Tom Sawyer, a mischievous and imaginative boy who lives with his Aunt Polly in the fictional town of St. Petersburg, Missouri. So you see, just like that, I'm able to change the reading level based off of what modifier I put in, the tone, all that stuff, because... And this is like amazing. For, I think this is one of the best parts of it for educators is I'm able to make accommodations for students at all different levels by simply changing the prompt that's in there. And I think that's really, really cool. And so, and it's in that conversational tone too, but it also can be like, it spits this out in like a way that I could copy and paste that into a Google doc and share that with my students. Like it. So then with that point uh, is Google, uh, it's copying and pasting the best method to get things out of chat GPT or it's like the it. only way right now you can do these things. They do allow you to share the link, um, but it's not great. Uh, it comes up in and looks like this. So it's not really all that good. So essentially what I have been doing is copying it. I will say that copying it out of here is a little bit easier on the shared link. Um, but the problem that happens is like, if I want to take this for my students now, I have to copy the whole thing. And then if I just do a simple paste in, it has this, and I, I don't know, my, this monitor stinks. So hopefully you guys can see it. Or did I do that from, no, I did that from there. Nope, I saw it, the, like, gray, the gray tone. Gray tone to it. Like it's just, eh, you know, but you can do things to get around that. Like you can do a, a shift paste without formatting. It's not ideal because then all my bullet points go away. So I got to reformat it, but it's what it is. Um, I think if I did this, I don't have that gray tone. I'm not hundred percent certain on that, but cause that's a new feature that just came out. Does that have the gray tone to it? Sure it does. Yeah. So you have to kind of mess with it a little bit in order to copy. I could live with gray tone. It's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it saves you time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it's really great in that it allows you to do these things. And then to your point, Kelsey, it's all about the prompts. Like it's all about what you ask it to do. And it's only going to be as detailed as the prompt that you ask it to detail for. So if I go back to my slides here, and we kind of scroll down and look at this for education. Like one of the things that, you know, I've got here is like, I want it to write a uh, science aligned lesson from the NGSS standard, NGA, NGSS standards, so the national science standards uh, in the 5E model format for second graders. So I can take this. Copy that. I'll just use this as my example. Go back in here and do a new chat. Paste that question in. And now I've got a lesson plan that I can build off of. And what I think is really neat about this, and I think it's also the qualifier to all this, is that this is great because this is going to save me so much time as an educator. Like I can get lesson plans now. Are you kidding me? Like that's hard, one of the hardest parts, figuring out what I'm going to talk about with these kids. The caveat is I still have to know the content. I still have to know if that's a good lesson plan or not. Like it's following the standard, 
but is it good? You know, like, I don't know. I'm not a second grade science teacher, but I'll be darned if that's not a good place to jump off from though, right? Like it's a solid start. And if it's not good, I change the parts. I keep the parts that are good. I take out the parts that stink. I added my own flair. I do this. I was working with a, uh, a school district a couple of weeks ago and the shop teacher asked me, he said, hey, would that thing make a lesson uh, for me on teaching somebody, uh, teaching the kids how to use a tape measure? And I was like, probably. It's like, let's prompt it and ask it. So, like I said, uh, I need a lesson on how to use a tape measure for a high school shop class. And it's going to give me a, a lesson. But is it any good? Is it better than the one that he already had? I don't know. It's not working right now, but it's. And should. is there a, a recommended, I mean, for the educational arm, uh, is BARD or, or ChatGPT a better tool for creating lesson plans or other education? It's a really good question. So I kind of have that a little bit spelled out here in these slides somewhere. Um, I had a BARD versus ChatGPT slide. I don't know where it went. Um, my opinion, um, so here's the biggest difference between BARD and between ChatGPT, is that ChatGPT is way more thorough than BARD. Like it gives you far more detail if you give it the right prompt. BARD is, in my experience, always very, very concise. Like it does not ever really give me ex extended, extensive answers. It's really concise and to the point. ChatGPT, if I ask it to give me a lesson that it's going to fill 90 minutes, it's going to give me 90 minutes worth of at least what it thinks will take 90 minutes, right? Or what its data says will take 90 minutes. And it's going to give me that. Whereas like ChatGPT or whereas Bard often gives you bullet points. So like if I ask Bard, well, let's put the same prompt in here and see what we get. So that's the lesson that Bard gives me, which is not super long versus the lesson that ChatGPT gave me. Which was a little longer. I don't know. You know, so it's I in my experience, Bard has always been more concise and to the point. Um, also, the thing that I've never really had success with with Bard um, and this is one, another example that I'll give you, like, so as a high school history teacher, I think this would have been so much fun to do with my kids is I can say something like, uh, let's see what Bart will give me. I'll say, write a letter from Nikola Tesla to Thomas Edison about Edison stealing Tesla's work. So there is my letter from Tesla to Edison, which I think would be super cool to use as a history teacher and being like, all right, as long as, again, I have to read this as a history teacher that knows this content and say like, okay, yes, that's all correct, right? Because when I go into my uh, prompt here, and actually I have this as a link here. So give me a second I can find it here, discussion between then two questions I think that might be important for us to get to tonight too, or one is the thought of um, how could students be using AI in a positive way in the classroom or impact their classroom experience that teachers could be guiding them to? And then what is the, the counter to that? Um, what can instructors or educators be doing um, when they maybe are getting content that they didn't intend to be created by an AI machine? Yeah. Um, it's what is turned in. So I think that's like kind of what we're looking at here is like my student can generate something like a letter from Tesla to Edison and not have to write it themselves, but it's a positive output that they can do. But the thing is to get back to like, did they fake it? It kind of covers both boats here because I can say like, okay, I want you to do this. They use Bard. Bard was good. Gave me a nice little concise letter. ChatGPT, I give it the same prompt. First thing right off the bat, it's wrong. 
if they don't catch that and they turn it into me, I'm like, well, you didn't do this. This wasn't you because Nikola Tesla didn't work out of Tesla Motors at 123 Electric Avenue in Palo Alto, California. Nikola Tesla, Palo Alto, California wasn't even a town when Nikola Tesla was creating, you know, alternating current. Like, so immediately I say, you have to fact check whatever you did this in and you didn't do that correctly. So you have to fix this. Like, I want you to create a conversation between Tesla and Edison and then turn it into me. That's a cool thing. The other thing is as a student um, or as a teacher, we kind of go to that like reading level thing. I have here an example of how this can help a kid. So a kid doesn't understand something. Um, I thought I had that linked. I don't. Uh, it's over here. This is the other thing I don't love about um, chat GPT is it's very difficult to organize. Um like you can't organize anything like it just goes in timeline order uh, here we go spying on the cold war so this is an example of a way that a student can use it where they don't understand a complex topic that's been presented to them in class or they've been assigned a piece of uh of text that they don't understand or it's at a reading level that doesn't make sense for them so i took this article about uh the soviet cold war or the cold war between the soviets and the united states and i said rewrite this article at a sixth grade reading level so similar to what I did with the Tom Sawyer thing, except I'm taking a piece of information that I would have had students read and then putting it in and it's going to rewrite it for me at a sixth grade reading level. And then I can ask it down here as a student and say, what are some questions that I should be able to answer based off this text for high school history? And now I've got a study guide for a piece of content that made my teacher just said, read this, and we're going to talk about it in class tomorrow. And the kid can actually put that in, put it at a level that makes sense for them, and then get the bullet points of what they should study about that topic. The other thing that a student can do for helpfulness that you could like guide them to using this correctly is asking things like, what are some discussion questions I should know about? What are the key points? Or one of the benefits of this, I think, for everybody, teachers and kids, is we have a complex topic like um, explain the slave trade from 1700s to me like a sixth grader. And now it's gonna talk at a sixth grade tone, but more importantly, this is gonna essentially not really dumb it down, but just make it easier to digest. Like if this is just something like, I just need to know what this is. It's a complex topic. Like there's a lot of things going on. I just need to know the basics. You can ask it and it's going to be able to give that to you. So as a student, I can use this as my helper. Like this is your assistant. Like that's what it is. It's an assistant, learning assistant for students. It's a learning assistant for adults. It's a teaching assistant. Like it's all there for you. Now the question becomes, what happens when a kid does this? And they say, okay, I need, I need you to write a paper, write a five paragraph essay on the causes of the Cold War from the Russian perspective. And so say I, I was a teacher and I knew that I was assigning that, right? Like that was my ass assignment. Would you say I should go in and ask the same question and see what I get? And then maybe that's a comparison if they're worried that they It'd might be, be different. Getting... Yeah. So if you guys that, ask right? this question, it's going to give you something different because you might change one word or, or something like that. Um, the biggest thing here is, and this is in talking to teachers and to educators a lot over the last several months and some that have had kids turn in this work. First of all, not every kid knows that this stuff exists. Something like uh, in a recent study that I saw, something like only like 18% of students even know that ChatGPT is a thing. Um, and even less than that are using it. Um, they know that AI is a thing because of Snapchat on their phone. And the first thing that pops up on Snapchat is Snapchat's AI. So this isn't a, an epidemic of proportion of kids turning in falsified work. Um, what I'm gonna know as a teacher is that if you just copy and paste what I just did into a paper, it, it's just not going to be you. 
like it's it, you can I can very clearly tell like right away that this isn't you. Even if I say this is great, I can say write this as an 11th grade or uh, we'll say 10th grade. 10th grade. But as a teacher, you couldn't even copy this back in and say, did you write this? Right. Like, no, it won't. Isn't... It will say like, maybe. <laughs> like it literally does. I did it before. It was like, it could be. And I'm like, well, that didn't help. Like, of course it could be. Anything could be. Like, <laughs> like you can see here, like I've got now as a 10th grade student and, and like, it says like, Cold War was like super intense times when the United States and Soviet Union were like, nope, we're not friends. So even if it tries to put in some of those modifiers, it's like no kids actually turn. Well, I, I should say because some kids have turned stuff like that into me. But like, I'm not buying that as that's from you. Here's what uh, here's the best advice that I've that I've got from other teachers that I've embarked on people to is that if you're worried um, the first time that it happens <clears throat> and you can't prove it, maybe the kid's denying it. You ask him or her uh, and they're denying it. There's there's two causes of action. The one that I like the best is that it just, you grade it to the hardest extent that your rubric allows you to grade it to. Like you light this paper up because it is not going to be deep. It's not going to be detailed to where your rubric is going to ask for it. Um, it's probably going to be pretty okay, but not great. And so you just tear it apart. What's interesting is that I'll put something I wrote in, or I had chat GPT write for me. I put it into a Google doc and Grammarly starts correcting its grammar. So the bot is correcting the bot because the grammar is incorrect. And so that's another red flag right there. Or, you know, this kid's not very good at grammar and you're like, your grammar is like almost perfect. This isn't right. Like there's a red flag right there. And so I had a teacher say, I just lit it up. I graded them because it wasn't a good essay. They just copy and pasted whatever the first thing was that ChatGPT put in there and it wasn't good. And so that was an interesting way to go about it because then she also said without calling those kids out, because uh, she did question them and they denied it. Uh, and she said, I, and I love this. She said, when I handed them all back, I handed them all back in class. And I just very clearly said, there were five of you in here that I believe used AI to generate your papers. And I want to let the class know that all five of those papers were graded within the rubric and all five failed because the content was not good or not up to my standards that I needed to meet my rubric. And that, she kind of sent a message to the whole class at that point. The other part of this comes down to, if you're worried that it's happening again, the other thing that I have is you have two minutes, almost like you have to defend your doctoral thesis in front of a committee. Like, okay, I think that there are, uh, I have suspicions that multiple students in here have written their paper uh, or done their work uh, using AI. You can turn that paper in, but I need you, every one of you to come up, you have 45 seconds to summarize your key points of this topic to the entire class or to me. And, or whatever time allotment you think is worthy of like knowing that they wrote it or they studied the content. And if they do that, my theory, I was always pretty lenient on kids. Um, but also like if a kid can regurgitate the information in a way that proves that they learned it, I, I don't really honestly care all that much if they wrote the paper themselves or if they used AI, because they must have used AI in a way that allowed them to learn the content. So like they were able to research they were able to look at the content just like I didn't want to write the lesson plan. So I had AI write the lesson plan for me. I think it'd be a bit of a double standard if they learned the content and then had AI write the paper and the paper was good, but that's only because they knew the right questions to ask. They knew how to edit it correctly. They changed the stuff that was wrong in it. And it's like, well, they spent some time on it. They learned the content. Like if they can, I always tell kids, like, if you have your phone out in class, I want you to put it away. But if you fail the test because you had your phone out in class, that's on you. That's not on me. I kind of look at it the same way with AI. If you're going to have AI do your stuff for you, that's more on you, but you're not going to pass the stuff that then I'm going to change my output to make it more creative. You have to present, you have to create a video, you have to create a podcast, you have to talk about this. Like I'm going to create different types of assessments that AI can't do for me, right? Or do for them. And that's where it comes into, you know, being interesting. So I think those are kind of my, my kind of ways that I want to let kids utilize this as a, as a tutor and has help. If they start having it create their own content, I need to change the way that I'm assessing them in a way that the AI cannot generate the content that is going to be graded for the assessment. And so that's kind of my, where I fall on all that right, wrong, and different. Everybody's got their own theories. That's the best one that I can think of so far and talking to some teachers. So 
No, that's very helpful, Ben. I think, especially as we think about the future, right? This is going to be a tool that they're going to continue to grow with and use um, if you can figure out ways to embed it in a way that's productive. Uh, it's and I think like most, a calculator, right? <laughs> like how to use the calculator well. Use that example. I'm glad you brought that up. It's almost like you threw me the layup there and I was able to take it and dunk it because, um, or the alley-oop, because the calculator, like when I was in high school 20 years ago, my math teacher's telling me that you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket. Like you got to learn all this. I got the entire freaking world history in my pocket, anything in my pocket. I can ask this anything and I don't have to know. I haven't had no calculus since my junior year of high school. And I don't ever want to use this for calculus, but like I could, I guess, or something. I don't know. But like the point being like the, I think the small difference between like AI for use and a calculator is that math is going to be very black and white. Like math is like the square root of 21 is always going to be the same number. Like this, the four plus four is always going to equal eight where AI gets interesting is that it's doesn't have the creative output to create new content that a human could. And so when I ask it to write a short story for me, it will, but it's not going to have that same flair that Tolkien has that Martin has that Hemingway had, right. That my, that I have, like I have asked it over here to write a short story about a six-year-old boy playing in the summer. And I'll bring it up here as I open it up. And it did, which is pretty cool. Gave me a fun summer day activity. And so I wanted to take this. I wanted this to be written. And then I actually used different uh, education tools. I used Book Creator and Canva to create a book based around this short summertime story. So I have writer's block. This is where it can help kids too. Kids struggling. I can't think of anything to write about. I can't think of anything to write about. I don't know. I'm supposed to write a paper today. I don't even know where to begin. You can just start asking it and it'll give you ideas and that'll help cure writer's block. I ask it to write me a short story about a uh, writer loves to go swimming in his pool, play baseball, go golfing with his dad, play basketball in the driveway and play with his little one-year-old baby brother. Gave me a really cool little story about a six-year-old boy doing all those things, which is pretty neat. And I was able to take that, put it into a really creative book and now I have a book about this and I use pictures of our summer activities and videos in the book to make a really cool book. I didn't write the story, but I did write the book and it helped, you know, creation. It was pretty cool. I'll say this. I want to show you this now too. And this will be kind of the last thing and like the limitations and challenges. And we touched on this this morning, but the bias component of this. And so these tools are as biased and moral as the people that program them and upload them. And I don't think this is a, this isn't like a, a glaring, like woke thing by any means, but like, just as a, a point, that story that it wrote about writer just had some gender stereotypes in it, which, you know, is just interesting to like, kind of point out, like when they returned home, writer's mom had prepared a delicious lunch for them. It's like, well, what if writer didn't have a mom or maybe writer had another dad, you know, like, I don't know, but like, I didn't tell it up here anything about writer's mom but it takes into that like feeds into the data that oh well writer must have a mom and mom must have made lunch and so again it's just a little bit interesting and then the last one here um in this is like it after lunch they played a game of ba baseball in the backyard uh with his dad when i was putting this book together the only pictures and videos i could find were actually writer playing baseball with his mom and so i had to change that text to reflect mom and so it's just interesting that like you know again not a big huge issue but it could be a big huge issue if like writer didn't have a mom and a writer didn't have a dad you know and like that could be a big thing but the chat the the language model doesn't know that you know it's going to be a little biased it's going to use the most random thing it's going to not the most random thing the most stereotypical thing essentially uh, of that so there's a little bit of that bias and morality um issue that we have to think about this is a really good image here as we kind of wrap but this is a, a teacher cyborg and notice this is an image generation tool here. So this is in Canva where you can do text to image and it gave all females. And then you say a teacher cyborg and you just did it again and again, all females, but I don't know, I guess that could be a male. I'm not sure. Um, and then you say a teacher leading a class in a lesson about AI. And then all of a sudden it just does all males and they're all white, you know? And then you go to a teacher and now we've got a white guy, a white girl, black guy and a black girl. And so we've, it's just, so it's all the same tool. Like it's literally the same program, all prompted something different with very different results with a little bit of like 
you know, you've got a kid in your class who's black or Mexican or, you know, ethnically. And they're like, none of those look like me, but the, the model doesn't know that, you know, like the model is just creating what the most facts that it has and then spitting them out. And so it's really, you know, just a kind of an interesting, uh, you know, component that we have to be aware of um, when we're using these tools. Um, hey, Ben, when you yeah. use that in Canva, is that those are all non-copyrighted. Those are like they're creating those images. Right. So they're non-copyrighted. The interesting component of this that is uh, part of that limitations and challenges, you know, I think workshop that we're going to have to probably pull out of this is that all of the stuff that AI creates, who owns it? Do I own it? Because I'm the one that prompted it. Does Canva own it because it's their tool, but also it's not actually their tool. It's an app that's embedded in their tool. So does the person or does the company that generates the image, this text image, do they own that picture? Because their, their program created it. And that's where we get into some really interesting, like legal complications because it's not copyrighted, right? Like it's not like some artists work. So you can use it, but like now it's like, well, is that, but is that mine then? Or is it theirs? And often that's embedded in the terms of service, which Kelsey goes all the way back to this morning. We were kind of laughing about that. You got to read through it. And some of them, it's a little murky even. Like when you look at the terms of service, you're like, oh, I don't even know if this is mine or not. Like there's audio creation tools that are out there. Um, so yeah, it's a great question that um, is currently going through the courts. So if I did this session next year, I might have a better answer because some stuff could be decided legally by then, or it could still be in the courts because we don't really know. Um, it's but I really think that takes us to such a good point of like, um, what I encourage people to do is take some of these tools and give them a try and yeah. bring your questions back to us. And we will do a session two or maybe a session three or a session three, and four and five as we continue forward um, with all these questions. Because I do think uh, each of these tools is going to continue to evolve as we saw that one tool what your experience was last time to today, different. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely um, a learning curve of each of us as individuals, but also the tools are evolving um, and have lots to, to be learned. So much. Yep. Play, 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 get in, see how you can use them, see what you can do with them. I think that's the biggest, biggest thing that I can, can kind of ask. Thank you very much. You did a nice job. Ben, this is fantastic. Really appreciate it, man. Happy to do it. Happy